taxes, getting taxed. The other guy is in debt and pays no tax and is wealthy off other people's money. We live our life trying to be debt free. When if we would just succumb to being indebted to Jesus, we'd have it all. We'd be wealthy above wealth. Oh, e branda monde ignaba ose. So what's happening in the church is we have a traditional teaching that says, "Hey, just do this because work hard, work long, be faithful." You know what the rich people say? I, I don't work for money. I make money work for me. Money produces more money for me. So I feel in some ways like the guy who I can't remember his name. Somebody needs to Google him for me so that I keep call, stop calling him nameless dude. Who? Irwin Shaw. So I feel a little bit like Irwin Shaw only in the church trying to tell people that the way that we've been brought up that ministry happens in the house and only in the house and we've got to go get people from outside and bring them in for them to receive ministry, I feel like it's falling on deaf ears because that's not the way we've been taught. That's not what we've seen demonstrated. That's not what we've known to be true. That all, all of our idols in the faith and those that we look up to, fathers and, and, and mothers in the faith, they did it this, this other way. And why are we diverting from what works? Because it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. How many generations do we have to go before we figure out what we've been doing ain't getting it did? So we've got to do things a bit differently. Why do you think Jesus said, in order to have your life, you must first lose it? <laughs> How does that make any sense? If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, you've got to be the servant of all. Huh? So there's a lot of things that seem odd or inverted or crazy that actually works in God's economy. What we've got to figure out is we are sojourners. We are temporarily in this realm passing through on our way to glory. So I have to learn how to deal with stuff in this realm while not missing how I'm supposed to function in the other. And sometimes they conflict. One of the greatest complaints of people that are in and outside the church is a word called hypocrisy. How many has ever been called a hypocrite before? How many has ever called somebody else a hypocrite before? the most you voted all night. So hypocrisy is the practice of professing beliefs, feelings, or virtues that we don't really have. Oh. A practice of confessing and saying, this is what I believe, but we don't. Saying, oh, I really have compassion for them, but you don't. Saying that this is a virtue in my life. This is, this is something that I elevate and put on a platform that I try, to, I try to live by, and we don't. We say what we believe others believe, and we say what we believe will enamor us to them or them to us. But really, what we're trying to do is just get in a relationship. You know, it's kind of like dating. You take a picture in front of a sports car. You never said it was yours, but you didn't say it wasn't. You go find the biggest house that you can find and you, and you lean up against it like you own it. And those are the pictures that you post. I don't even have time. There's a lot of pretending that's happening in the house of God. Jesus, help me today. We have people that are pretending to know God. We have people that are pretending to live for God. We have people pretending that they care who God is and what God's done. There's a lot of pretending. We have people that pray with no power. 
because they're pretending to carry that which they don't carry. Oh, Jesus, help me. To, what are you doing to me? This is not what I wrote. You hear what I'm saying? Wait, there's a lot of pretending happening. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. We're not okay. We're deprived, we're jacked up, we're messed up, we're broken. And if we don't get some real touch and real healing and real mending from God, we're all going to hell. You hearing anything that I'm saying? You are not getting brownie points with God when you stand before him and say, well, I went to no excuses. He's going to say, then you should know better. So there's an illustration. It's, it's, it's old. Many of you have probably heard it, but in the event that you haven't, it lays a foundation. Long ago, there was a king who had a passion for fashion. He always wanted the latest and greatest for his royal wardrobe. And so one day, a couple of brave cheaters came to his city bragging about this new material that they had discovered. They said it had magical powers, and if anyone was wise and had fine taste in clothing, the material would shine with unbelievable beauty. But to anyone who was ignorant about fashion, foolish or incompetent, the material would be completely invisible. Guys, this message is being taught in churches all over the world. If you're holy, you understand this, and if you're not, you won't. So the king was overjoyed, and he, he, he could look and show off his wisdom at the same time. So he put them into work at making him a new suit. And so finally the day came. It was time for the king to put on his new suit and parade around in front of the entire city for everyone to see. And so the whole town had heard about this magic fabric and wanted to see it for themselves if they were wise enough, of course. In the king's chambers, the designers came in, pretended to dress the king. They pretended to adjust his collar as if the fabric were really there. They pretended to double-check their measurements and straighten out his royal cape. But deep down inside, everyone, including the king, knew there was nothing there. So although the king was entirely uncovered, everyone pretended to admire his outfit. And so here's the king, naked as a blue jay, frolicking around the city uh, with, with nobody daring to say a word. And as he paraded naked through the city, city center, everyone pretended to see the beautiful new suit because no one wanted to admit that they were ignorant or foolish or lacking in good taste. So while all the grown-ups pretended the, the suit looked gorgeous, the birthday suit that is, one little boy turned to his mom and said, Mommy, the king isn't wearing any clothes. But everyone hushed him and pretended to believe because no one wanted to admit that they had anything lacking. People in the church are doing this all the time, pretending that nakedness isn't there to our own destruction. We have gotten so bad that we have pretended that people that are not okay with God are okay with God. And that actions that God hates are okay with God because God told you something that's contrary to what his word tells the world. There's a lot of pretending and hypocrisy going on in the church. And I want you to understand that my Bible says the judgment is coming to the house of God because, before it comes anywhere else. So you need to understand God is showing up in his house if for no other reason than to hand out punishments. God's tired of people that want to wear the t-shirts and not live the life. He's tired of people that want to post scripture and don't even know what it means. He's tired of people that are misrepresenting who he is because they say what people think is right, but they have no understanding of what they're saying. Oh. Man, I find myself getting fired up. And it's not an outside thing, it's an inside thing. Hypocrisy, my friends, is a stepping stone on the, on the path to mediocrity. Hypocrisy is the gateway drug to being half-hearted. I mean, think about it. If you come to Jesus and you withhold who you really are in order to give him what you think he wants from you, how many times have you witnessed a marriage that you knew was doomed from the beginning because they didn't even love each other. They just got caught. They got caught up in a moment. They, she got pregnant. 
I remember one of the first marriages that I stood up for a friend of mine, literally before we walked out to the, to the altar to meet the bride. He looked at me and he said, he said something along, it's been a lot of years now, he said something along the lines of, he said, you need to make very sure before you walk down to the altar. And I called him by name and I said, do we need to cancel this? He said, no, 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 we're fine. They didn't make it two years. He knew going into it, his heart wasn't there. Oh, we have people that are coming wanting to get married to God, hoping that the marriage to God will get them out of a jam. They're not giving themselves, and God's not stupid. If you're not giving you, he's not giving you him. God's not saying, well, let me give you a piece of you just to, just to show you that it's legit. You bring half a heart to God, and he keeps all of himself. It's an all or nothing scenario with God. <laughs> God speaks to a church in this scenario in Revelation 3. They were cited for violating the Lord by living a mediocre lifestyle. They pretended everything was good. They thought that they were successful, and by human standards, they probably were. They had a fat bank account. They, they drove up in Rolls Royces. They, they lived in palaces. They, they had fine linen that you could actually see. But the truth of the matter is they were spiritually disabled. Did you hear that? They were spiritually disabled, and their underlying problem was mediocrity. Mediocrity, by definition, is the state of being moderate to inferior in quality. Or watch this. Mediocrity means ordinary. If you know anything about Jesus, you cannot belong to him and be ordinary. Jesus didn't make us to be ordinary. We're extraordinary in every facet of our creation. So the Bible calls mediocrity lukewarmness. And in Revelation 3.15, it says, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. What he's saying is, I wish you'd be passionate about something. What are you passionate about? That was overwhelming. What are you passionate about? Cars? Money? Fame? relationships, what floats your boat? What God is saying is, I want you to either fight with me or fight against me. Pick one. I don't know how many of you have ever been in a real scrap, a real fight. But when you find yourself in one, the last thing you want is somebody sitting between you two doing nothing but being there. Stand up and swing at me. Give me a reason. You know what I'm saying? Do something. Come with me. Come against me. But do something. And most of the people in the house of God today are inanimate. They have no passion. They have no drive. They have no commitment. I never thought I'd be one of these pastors, but here it goes. It's amazing to me that we have put up with this in the church as long as we have. It's called the summer slump. You want to take a vacation? Take a vacation. You want to take a week, two weeks? Take a month. I don't care. Take your vacation. Enjoy creation. Enjoy one another. Spend that money. Do what you need to do. But if you, if you find yourself more committed to your job than you do to your God, there's a problem. Oh, so you're saying, if I miss church, then I'm not committed to God. I didn't say that. He said it. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as some are doing, that you're following instead of following what I said to do. And then he said, you need to show up in the house of God more often the closer you see the day of his appearing coming. You are blinder than a bat if you don't see that we're closer than we've ever been to Jesus returning. If you're not seeing Scripture played out on the news, <laughs> 
then you're not even trying. When children are really little and you have plans on the weekend and you say, Johnny, get up. Huh? And so they're little. I mean, you're not going to beat them up, right? You're, you're, we're, we're talking, you know, two, three, four years old. And so you go to pick them up and they're like a limp noodle. And so you start peeling their PJs off and, and putting their shirt on and putting their clothes on and taking them to the sink and holding them up and brushing their teeth while their head just bobs. I mean, you're, you're doing it all for them. It's cute when they're little. Fast forward 90 years. It's not as cute. And we somehow have the mentality in the house of God that if I just show up, I'll be taken care of. They'll bathe me, feed me, clothe me, pay my utility bills, fix my car, cast the devil out of my life that I'll be sure to invite as soon as I back into my life as soon as I leave. This is not your tune-up shop. <laughs> I hear a new a new t-shirt. It's being inspired right now. Right now. Okay. So, what is he saying in, in Revelation 3:15? He says, I know your deeds. Let me talk about deeds for just a second. We have a lot of people whose heart is not right, who's doing the deeds of a right person in the eyes of others. You need to hear that people that do good things does not mean that it came from a good heart. There are people that have bad hearts that will do good deeds in order to cause you to believe that they are good at heart. It's all about deception. That's why, listen, even when it comes to dating, Rule of thumb, it better be a minimum of a year. My mom and dad used to tell me, you better see them in every situation known to men. You better see them grieving, angry, mad, road rage. You need to see them sleeping. You need to see them crying. You need to see them in every facet you can find them in. Family squabbles. You better see them in every aspect. Because once them I do's are done, it's dead. People watching this on YouTube and Facebook are thinking, this must be a, a country church. <laughs> All the bad grammar. <laughs> this is why, this is why we cannot be quick to make alliances. <laughs> the striking of the hands and the making of an agreement. You got to be careful who you're, who you're making covenant with and who you're making alliances with. Not every church that has Jesus on the sign has Jesus in the house. Be careful who your alliances are with. Moving on. God was giving the Laodicean church a stern warning. And it really serves as a serious warning to us today. God is tired of tired Christians. Let me say it again. God is tired of of tired Christians. I need you to hear this. God is not tired. Neither does he get tired. And the only way you and I get tired is when we're doing it without him. He is the nuclear power plant that lives on the inside of us that empowers us to do what we can't do without him. So the only way we get tired is if we set him aside and do it on our own. How many people have to go to hell before you understand your value to the unsaved while you're jockeying for position trying to be seen by those that already know Jesus the ones that don't know Jesus are damned that's why I don't care what you think about me send your hate mail 
to I don't care at gmail.com. I'll be sure to never respond to that. I don't care what you think of me. It's not important. I will not lose an ounce of sleep. I will not have to take melatonin. I will not have to choke myself out because I don't care. The ones that it matters what their opinion, not necessarily of me, but the God in me is, are the ones that aren't sitting here yet. You know enough to know better. Whether you live better is on you. You can't come at Jesus half-hearted. You can't come to the altar and say, here's the peace I'm willing to give you today and think that God's going to go, oh, well, I'm good with that. <laughs> you don't know him. You've never met him. Yeah. You take your beloved up to the altar. I'll be as faithful as I can. Marriage counseling will start Monday. <laughs> so the very clear message that Jesus has sent to his people today is that he's fed up with and will not tolerate mediocrity or half-heartedness in the body of Christ. Half-heartedness is what's happening outside the body of Christ, and that's why they're having all the issues that they're having. Look at Revelation 3. Let me start with verse 14. Now I'm going to read from the Amplified. The Bible says, to the angel or the pastor, the divine messenger of the church of Laodicea, write. These are the words of the amen. You know what that means? So be it. These are the words of the amen, the trusted and the faithful, true witness, the beginning and origin of God's creation. I know your deeds. I know that you are neither cold, invigorating, refreshing, or hot, healing, and therapeutic. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm, which is spiritually useless and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth, rejecting you with disgust. I want you to know that some translations put there, I will spit you out of my mouth. That is too kind a word. You are not a loogie on the back of his throat. You are, when, you, when you are lukewarm, you make him nauseous. I have some childhood memories of me hugging a toilet bowl and heaving so hard I thought my feet were going to come through. I remember one time I was so young they didn't make me clean it up. That was a joke, y'all. So, uh, I was really young, and I remember we had a long hallway, and in my mind as a kid, I want to say it was from this green chair to the last row. In my mind as a kid, it was probably half that, but we're going with what I remember. And, and I got up to go get some help, and I let it go, and it went from this end of the hallway all the way down to the other end of the hallway. That's vomit. That's what he's saying here. Because you're lukewarm, because you're half-hearted, because you're spiritually useless. You need to hear that. I love that, that phraseology in the Amplified. Do you know that if you come to Jesus with half a heart, you're useless to him? If you come to him with 95% and say, I'm giving you 95%, you are useless. Because you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth, rejecting you with disgust. Because you say, I am rich and, pro and prospered and grown wealthy, and I have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked without hope and in great need. I counsel you to buy from me gold that has been heat heated red hot and refined by fire so that you may become truly rich. And white clothes representing righteousness to clothe yourself so that the shame of your nakedness will not be seen. And healing salve to put on your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I dearly and tenderly love, I rebuke and discipline, showing them their faults and instructing them. So be enthusiastic and repent. 
Change your inner self, your old way of thinking, your sinful behavior. Seek God's will. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door of the church and continually knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, restore him, and he with me. He who overcomes the world through believing that Jesus is the Son of God, I will grant to him the privilege to sit beside me on my throne, as I also ever came and sat down beside my Father on his throne. He who has an ear... Let him hear and heed what the Spirit says to the churches. You need to know that I have two groups of people that are hearing me today. Those that have spiritual ears to hear what I'm saying and those that are deaf to what I'm saying. If you find yourself offended at my demeanor or what I'm saying or how I'm saying it, you are deaf to the spirit of what God is saying because it's not about me. It's not about my presentation. It is about the fact that I am regurgitating and telling you fresh and new what the word of God says. If you're offended at the message, it's because he said it, not because I regurgitated it. You catching what I'm saying? Too many pastors are trying to fill their houses so they can say they had 500 people in church. I'd rather have 50 in heaven than 5,000 in the church. You understand what I'm saying? This is not the scale that I'm getting graded by. <laughs> I'm on the sliding scale, the, the scale of obedience. Until some of y'all were never graded on a, on a sliding scale. I want you to hear that half-hearted effort is worthless. Tell your boss. I'll give it a go. I'll try. When you make the Whopper, I need you to make sure that the meat never hits the floor. I'll give it a shot. When a customer makes you angry, I do not need you putting things in the frying pit that don't belong there. Maybe. If that won't fly in the secular world, it will not fly in the supernatural. Half-hearted effort is worthless. People refuse to pay for half-hearted labor. This is so minor, so minor, but I took my son to work with me the other day. And uh, he got on top of a ladder and was shifting a ceiling tile. And I'd got it pinched pretty good. And so he got it unpinched and got the insulation back on top of it and set it right back in the ceiling grid where it was supposed to go and got it done. And it was two little bitty pieces of insulation that had made it between and was sticking out between the tile and the grid. I said, son, that won't fly. He said, what are you talking about? I said, see those two little pieces right there? He said, I didn't even see it. I said, you didn't, but the customer will. And our, our job that we're doing will be graded by what they can see. That's why we live the way that we do. <laughs> That's why we live the way that we do. We don't, we don't leave insulation hanging out. We don't leave a, a jacked up, messed up life in our wake. And I know there's a lot of people preaching, hey, oh, just bring it all to Jesus. Yes, bring it to him so he can change it. <laughs> you do understand the purpose of you coming to Jesus just as you are. And so that you will leave, not as you were. I mean, you do understand that stuff. You do know that when you come to the altar and you say, I do, you were no longer one. But you are now one. Anybody get that? You do understand that when you get married, you're going home with them. They're living with you. And we got people coming to Jesus. Well, I came to Jesus and... But I can do what I want to do. No, no. Now you can do what he wants you to do. <laughs> some of you, some of you are eating the cornflakes again for the very first time because I see you considering going, is this really what I signed on for? It really is. The rules didn't change because the secular ideology got inside your head. Your relationship with Jesus doesn't get to morph because the world tells you that he's too strict. <laughs> I want to sleep so well tonight. Some of you ain't. <sighs> we look at things and we, 
that we gave God 50% and we say to ourselves, well, that's better than nothing. That's 50% more than I'd have given God ever, ever before in my life. God ought to be happy that I gave him 50. You got to know that God's on the other side of the table going, I gave you 100. Not only of myself, but I gave you 100 of yourself to make a decision of what you wanted to do with it. Everything you got, I gave you. I'm not even asking you to originate anything. I'm just saying give back to me what I gave you. <laughs> How hard is that? Apparently pretty hard. Mark 12, 30. And you must, everyone say must. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. The second commandment is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. We've got too many people having the word of God at their disposal that are still trying to give the offering of Cain. I'll give him what I got. I'll give him what I have left over. I'll give him what I think he needs. I'll give him what he thinks he wants. And we're missing the point. I want you to hear that giving God less than what he has required is setting the example and expectation in other people that it's okay for them to do the same. Let me give you a, a real down-to-earth example. I love my wife. Come here. I love my wife. And because I love my wife, I say kind things to her, whether I'm in front of you or away from you. Because what I do in private, I will ultimately do in public, if for no other reason than because of habit. See, some of you think you're so slick, and you don't understand that the habits that you have outside, you think don't show up inside, and you're the only one that's fooled. So, if I disrespect her in front of you, what I'm basically doing is saying, she holds no value to me, therefore she should hold no value to you. So by me showing disrespect to Rachel, I'm giving you the authority to do disrespect to Rachel as well. But the inverse is true. When I honor her and I respect her, and I show love and deference to her, and I do that in front of you, I'm setting the standard for how you should treat her. Am I making any sense to anybody? I'll take the three and a half half-hearted clap. Get that half-hearted half-hearted claps that I got. But I want you to I want you to grab this. It's the same thing with God. When we treat God half-hearted, we're setting the example that all, all God wants from any of y'all is half. Thanks, babe. Churches without a passion to serve are in imminent danger. Again, churches without a passion to serve are in imminent danger. You want to know why? Because there is a driving force on the inside of you called the Holy Spirit of God that is not happy being still. When you walk by people, he's jumping and lunging saying they need a touch and they need healing and they need salvation and they need... So there, every time you go, you're... Your belly is trying to take you all different kinds of places, and we're trying to control him instead of being led by him. So the Holy Spirit is always at work. But you couldn't tell that by the lifestyle of the believers that say that they hold him. Oh, oh, oh I know I'm not getting any fan mail today. So it's important that we succumb to the passion of God on the inside of us so that we find ourselves working in conjunction with him instead of working against him. So listen to an illustration about imminent danger. How many has ever heard of Chernobyl? How many has never heard of Chernobyl? How many didn't vote? How many didn't vote when I said that you didn't vote and you didn't vote? So in Chernobyl, workers had, put, had to put on lead suits and scoop debris into a large hole 
over an exploded nuclear core. Each man could only work three minutes at a time because three minutes was a lifetime dose of radiation. The man who had to explore the debris near the core to find out if it had been breached, while he was down there, something dripped on his head. He was immediately terrified for his life. If it was liquid from the core, he was a dead man. His bones would literally rot on the inside of him. But after a radiation test, he was relieved to discover that it was only water. He was walking through nuclear waste, and his life was in imminent danger. Being a lukewarm Christian is like walking around Chernobyl hoping you don't run into radioactive waste. I have looked at people that when they told me their age, I, I fainted inside. Because they looked my age and half again older. And was much younger than me. How many has ever made a statement or heard a statement of somebody that said, looks like they've lived a hard life? What does that mean? They've, they've aged. They're aged beyond their years because of hard living. I want you to hear that when we, when we are outside of the plan of God for our life, we age prematurely. God gives us, uh, gives us a prescription for long life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the earth. You can tell by looking at some people, they never honor their parents a day in their life. When we are functioning outside of what God has designed for us to function in, we begin to lose time. It's like when I'm serving Jesus, instead of time going, it goes, So I can get more done in the same amount of time as somebody who in their own power outside of God is time is going. Why do you think God says that he'll, re, he'll give us back the time that the canker worm has stolen? Why? When, when, we, when we come out of doing things our way and submit ourselves to Jesus, he takes our clock that's going just slow. Slows it down. Click. Click. He's adding time to us that we would not have had if we were still doing it our own way. I don't ever want you to hear it from me, and don't ever let it be played at my funeral, the song that I did it my way. It needs to be written, rewritten for those that really love Jesus that says I did it his way. The truth is, people don't know their own true, real condition. We think we do, but we don't. How many of you ever gotten dressed and you think the outfit looks really good, but you want to be really sure? Babe, how's this look? Wear this one. <laughs> you know? Come on. And so you think, you know, she might have been doing her makeup and, and, and a light bulb had burned out or something. So she's doing it in the dark and it just, it, she came away looking like a harlot for all I know. She goes, back, hey, how does this look? Oh. Take a tissue. And, you see what I'm saying? We, we don't always know. That's why we need people that we know love us to tell us the truth. Don't ask somebody that's trying to get something from you what your real condition is. That's why we got to go to Jesus. Daddy, what, what, what's really going on in my life? 
What's really happening? Why am I dealing with all this mess? Why is this going on? Why am I having these thoughts? Why am I having these compulsions? Why is all this happening? Well, you, you vacated my plan for your life back over there. You want to make your way back over there, we'll start again. We need people that will tell us the truth. How about this one? You know, I know you've been going through a tough time, but four weeks outside of the house of God is not good for you and it's not good for me. I need you to do what you know you need to be doing and get back in the house of God. How about that? How about that? How about this one? I know you've been going through a lot, but your, your, your anger face is really showing. And, and you need to know that I'm not the punching bag for the anger that's coming out of you. What you need is the Jesus in me to quench the anger in you. So if you'll submit to me praying for you, we'll go ahead and deal with that right now. You, somebody's better tell the truth. Some of you got friends right now that you know that if God doesn't get them, they're going to end their own life. So what do you do? Oh, Lord, send somebody to go call Billy Bob and God save his soul. And God's going, It's like that one kid has made himself millions, I'm sure, on YouTube by doing what other people make a big deal about. And he does, he d- does it real simply. He just goes, that's going to be another T-shirt. <laughs> God, where are you? <laughs> anyway. Somebody hand out Benadryl at the door when you guys walked in. I'm just checking. People don't know the true condition. Revelation 3.17 said, you said, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. But you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You're saying everything's fine. Me and God are okay. And the Holy Spirit of God is standing up on the inside of you saying they're lying. We are so consumed by our own lies that we can't even, we can't even recognize the truth when it's told to us. That's why you can't get isolated. <laughs> you can't get isolated. Because you are always right in your own eyes. Even when you're dead wrong, you're right in your own eyes. People many times like to get isolated because they don't want to submit themselves to the scrutiny of others that would tell them the truth. And watch this. You don't have your own truth. (laughs) I'm all over the map today. There's not flavors of truth. There's truth... And there's not truth. Yeah, Jesus isn't real popular either right now, but he will be. It's been on rare occasion that I've looked across the audience and no excuses and seen people like this. And I'm seeing more of that tonight. Now everybody's putting their arms down real quick. I want to start throwing some of that. Have you ever had a friend that had a booger hanging from their nose? And they didn't know it. And you're trying to eat while looking. And so at some point you say, listen, It's like, oh, 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 I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. sorry. They, they, you know, they, they take care of it. I don't know how many times I've done that and I've said, only a real friend would tell you. Because it's uncomfortable for the person who's seeing the booger as much as it is for the person who's wearing the booger. So what I'm trying to tell you is when somebody comes to you and says, listen, I'm seeing this in your life, please understand it's, a, it's an imposition and a hardship for them just like it is for you to hear it. The only time there's a winner in that scenario is if the heart of the person giving that perspective is warmly received. Even if the information is rejected, if their heart is received, thank you for telling me. Thank you for sharing that with me. I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to go a different direction. But I honor the fact that you love me enough to say that. Do you hear where I'm at? You need to pay attention to the people that got enough guts to come up and tell you that you got a booger hanging. Those are keepers.
t-shirt. If your friend tells you you have a booger hanging, keep them. They're keepers. Have you ever had symptoms that didn't seem to disappear, and so you went to the doctor to find out why? And he either gave you instructions or medicine or both to resolve the issue that was causing the symptoms. How many's ever done that? How many's never done that? How many didn't vote? <laughs> so this is what we're called to do to each other. See, I had a friend not too long ago, and if I called her name, many of you would know him, so I won't call her name. They knew they weren't living right. They knew that they weren't eating healthy. They weren't drinking healthy. But at some point, they stopped caring. And then about the time they got their second wind and decided, I'm going to fix this. They started to eat right. They started to drink right. They started to lose some weight. They dropped dead of a widow maker. You have to know that there was warning signs all along the way. Heart attacks don't just always show up out of nowhere and just, surprise. They happen sometimes that way, but not always. There's typically signs that come ahead of that that's warning, saying, hello, warning, hello. Woo, 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 woo. You know, something to get your attention. It's that way in the spirit. When you find yourself compelled to do things that you know aren't right, but you oh, but God loves me anyway. It's okay with him. I need a moment for me. You catch anything I'm saying? And you won't get that if you hermit up in your house and isolate. Forsake not the assembling, the fellowshipping, the breaking of bread, the drinking of coffee with one another. can't camp there. I want to, but I can't. Don't make a handicapped church by failing to function. Don't make a handicapped church by failing to function. Don't refuse to work because the conditions aren't perfect, because they're never going to be perfect. Well, I'll give a word. If somebody confirms it and then another person confirms the confirmation and then one more person confirms the confirmation of the first confirmation, then I'll really know that it's time for me. The, the, the conditions are not going to be perfect. They're not going to meet your criteria. You're really going to have to take some risk. You're really going to have to step out of the boat into that water and pray that you walk. We all have to do it. You want to know why a lot of people aren't functioning in the ministry that they're called to do? Because they, unlike Peter, refuse to step out of the boat to test what they believe is God. So they'd rather live in the columns or the, the rooms of their own mind and say, yeah, God's dealing with, yeah, that, that's really God. And yeah, I, I really know better than what they're saying, but I'm not going to say anything. They're not saying anything because they don't know better because it wasn't God. You've got to learn to hear from him for yourself. I can ride a bicycle, but I can't ride a bicycle for you until you get on two wheels and you fall over a couple of times and you skin a knee and you realize it's a lot better for me to stay upright than it is for me to go horizontal. And you learn how to do it, then you can ride a bike. But for those of us that can ride a bike, we all can ride because we learned to ride. And all those that hear from God are hearing from God because they learned to hear from God. And those that are flowing in the gifts are flowing in the gifts because they've learned to flow in the gifts, which means that they had to make mistakes and they had to get it wrong and they learned how to get it right. They learned to tell the difference. We all have a journey. Don't despise somebody else's journey. What's the cure? to get rid of this mediocrity. It's not as easy as getting a prescription and taking a pill. I want you to hear that Jesus wants no excuses to be wildly successful. He called us. He gave us purpose. 
He's given us influence. And it's, it's with great intent. He wants this house to be full of healthy worshipers who worship him truly in spirit and truth. He wants us to be vital and healthy, growing beyond our means. He intends to do phenomenal, incredible, over-the-top, ridiculous, sublime things in this place. But he cannot work through you and I if we're sitting on our hands. He can't work through a group of people that lacks passion for who he is. I mean, you know I'm talking about every other church except no excuses, right? I mean, of course. (laughs) Jesus wants no excuses to be a healthy body that is transformed truly into his image. So in Revelation 3, 18 and 19, he says again, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put in your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. I want to remind you that this is written to the Laodicean church. (laughs) He's telling the saved to get right. He's calling the righteous to action. We cannot come to God and give him half-hearted effort. You don't do that on your job. You don't do that with your spouse. You don't give half-hearted effort to your kids. I've seen some of you love vehicles more than most love Jesus. Say, this is kind of heavy. It's only heavy because it's not been widely taught for a long time. So what's happened is over time, we towed the line, and then we started listening to the world a little bit more, a little bit more, and then we felt comfortable in doing what we were doing, and so we got farther and farther and farther away. And now somebody comes back and gives the original truth, and it's so far removed from where we're at that it feels like we're just getting hammered. The gospel didn't change. We did. God didn't move. We did. There are people that need to be healed, mended, restored that need to know about the love of God. And if we keep watering it down and watering it down and watering it down and watering it down, what they're going to get is anything but God. How do you make sure what they get is truly from Him? Keep it pure here. Quit watering it down in your own heart. Be real with yourself. The Bible says in the book of James that the Word of God is like a mirror. gives an accurate reflection of who we really are. You want to know the truth about yourself? Look in the mirror. And if you don't believe what the mirror says, ask a child. <laughs> you know another term or another word for politically correct? Lie. Oh, Emperor, your clothes are so beautiful. Because I don't want to admit that I'm ignorant and can't see it. Oh, wow, I totally understand that you should have the right to murder the unborn in your womb. That is so, I don't want to seem unwoke. That crept into the church. If you're looking for a place that won't offend you, I truly have one to please. (laughs) You wait here. I really am working to hear Jesus say, Well done. And for those of you who happen to be behind me in line, I'll be going, (laughs) see y'all there. (laughs) 
That's my goal. I'm working to that end. Not to have you go, oh, what a great mess. I just so love your, your, the, the way you present. <laughs> Don't care. People are dying. They don't know God. And what many who say they know God are carrying ceased to be God a long time ago. We need to get back to having him full strength because he's not giving us half a cross or half his heart. So we can't bring anything less to him. We need to bring him our whole heart and carry our own cross. Am I making sense? Lord, I bless your people today. I celebrate the fact that you are the same God today that you were when you built man. I thank you, Lord, that seasons change, bodies change, relationships change, but you're the constant. You're the constant. I celebrate your love for me. I celebrate your goodness and kindness towards me. And I thank you, Lord, that you won't be towards me what you won't be and aren't towards others. I'm asking you today, Lord, to draw us closer to you. I'm asking you today by your Holy Spirit to jerk all the slack out of our rope, out of our chain, out of our theology. Forgive us for being wooed by the world system. Forgive us for being intimidated by those that can shout the loudest and scream the worst obscenities. Forgive us for being more concerned about backlash than honoring the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm asking you today, God, to give us a transplant today, a heart transplant so that our heart beats as yours beats. And I'm asking you today, Lord, to give us a spine that we truly can stand against all of the attacks of the enemy because we have your spine in our back. Make us the resilient, dedicated people of God that you called us to be. And may we so represent you to others that others don't run from it, but run to you because they see you as you are because we stopped miss appropriating and misrepresenting who you truly are. Your standard is the highest. Your quality is the greatest. And your destiny for us is unsurpassed. So challenge us, grow us, stretch us, and make us the people of God that you've called us to be. In Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said. For those of you that made it to the end of the video, I congratulate you. Thank you so very much for joining with us. We'd love to see you here in the building with us. There's some things that happened before and after the video comes on and off that we'd love you to be a part of. 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City. We meet at 2 o'clock in the afternoons on Sundays, 6.45 p.m. on Thursday evenings. So until this coming Sunday, God bless you and have an incredible, incredible evening.